Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. At least nine Iraqis were killed and eight others were injured in several terrorist attacks in Baghdad. The bloodiest attack was a roadside bomb targeting an Iraqi army patrol in Al Amiriya district west of Baghdad. Al Amiriya was a stage in which more than four of the most destructive bombings took place. The capital Baghdad was shaken. The Iraqi police said that an explosive device targeted an Iraqi National Guard patrol, but no soldiers were injured. About an hour ago, we treated eight injured individuals at the emergency facility and received seven dead bodies. In another development, two people were killed, including a woman who worked in Al Khadraw in central Baghdad by unidentified gunmen who opened fire at civilians in Al Mansur district, west of the Iraqi capital. In Zaytuna district, east of Baghdad, some gunmen wearing Iraqi police commando uniforms kidnapped 50 employees of a private security firm and took them to an unknown location. Six security guards were left in the building. Iraqi police officials said, the kidnapped did not try to resist since they were under the impression that the gunmen were members of the Iraqi police forces. An Iraqi interior ministry official denied that the interior ministry had any connection with the incident. The target of the attack was a Rawafid company, which is known to employ a large number of former members of the Iraqi army. The Iraqi interior ministry stressed that it is conducting a thorough investigation into the incident. A U.S. airstrike on an Afghan village in the province of Nangarhar left two people, including a woman, dead and two others, including a child, injured. The American aircraft struck the area at night. Witnesses said that a building was destroyed by the assault. Two policemen who were present in the area were injured. Adam Khan, an Afghan police official, said that the American airstrike came just hours after a group of Taliban militants attacked the area. The police added that they found the body of a Taliban militant in the building that was destroyed by the U.S. airstrike. <laughs> Sources at the local Afghan police said that an American military chopper crashed in the Ghazni province in central Afghanistan. Ghazni's police chief, Abdul Rahman Sarjang, said that law enforcement personnel are searching for the site of the crash. So far, there is no information on why the helicopter crashed or the extent of the damages. <laughs> The reality of American human rights practices will be revealed in the following report. Confronted with these real images, do the perpetrators have the right to talk about human rights and international laws? The reality of Iraq, Vietnam, and Afghanistan are testimonies to America's definition of human rights. The mere statement by U.S. President George Bush, if you are not with us, you are against us, disregards others and draws draws red lines when it comes to free expression and political speech. The occupation of Iraq, the destruction of its institutions, the killing of its people, the aggression against its holy sites, the elimination of its history and scholars are all testimonies in the 21st century of the truth about American civilization and its understanding of human rights. In addition to this record is the American practice of racist segregation. The revolution of Martin Luther King Jr. was a national 
rejection of the discrimination of blacks by whites. Even before this, Americans practiced the systematic extermination of the indigenous people of America, the native Indians. American civilization was founded on a mentality of building settlements. Its domestic and foreign policies are based on oppressing people in our region and in Iraq. Supporting Israeli crimes and financing it economically and militarily reveals this truth. Why isn't American taxpayer money being spent on development and growth projects where it ought to be? In this context, aren't American double standards with regard to its economic and political policies yet another human rights violation? Establishing detention centers in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere and adopting a policy of torture and humiliation without regard to human dignity, aren't these aspects of American human rights violations? Not to mention the American military bases throughout the world. Is not the return to occupation and colonization the biggest violation of human rights? So what's next? Can American officials continue to hide behind statements and reports aimed at making them look better while holding others accountable? The American Defense Department asked Congress to allocate $100 million to build more prisons in Iraq. James Jeffrey, the coordinator of Iraqi affairs in the department, said that the objective of this fund is to increase the capacity of Iraqi prisons. He also said that the American forces will hand over more detainees to the Iraqi authorities, which means that they will need additional space to accommodate them. Jeffrey talked about other allocations to increase the number of attorney generals and legal counselors, in addition to retrofitting institutions and securing the lives of judges, who according to him are putting their lives at risk by doing their jobs. The fund would include $89 million to improve security for power and oil installations. Some of the fund will be used to bury oil pipelines, build monitor towers and fences, and train guards. Reuters quoted the expert Rick Parton from the Institution for International Strategic Studies as saying that building prisons is not the best project to undertake when America has been advocating freedom. <laughs> American medical sources reported that about one-third of American soldiers who served in Iraq need psychiatric care. According to the American Medical Association, which published the report in its newsletter, most of the soldiers returning from Iraq suffer from psychological problems. The report indicated that the percentage of soldiers coming back from Iraq who have been affected is much higher than the percentage of those that have returned from Bosnia, Kosovo, or Afghanistan. The report, however, did not the reason for this trend. It's worth mentioning that the American Defense Department has made it mandatory for returning soldiers from Iraq to answer a questionnaire that can help evaluate the psychological health of those who fought in the war and to work for providing them with long-term medical care. The acting Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert confirmed that Israel will define the permanent borders beginning from now until 2010. Olmert told an Israeli newspaper that if he becomes Prime Minister after the elections at the end of this month, he will draw the permanent borders of the Israeli entity. There are three options being proposed to resolve the issue of Jerusalem, which were recently announced. These options would achieve wide-scale gains for Israel. One of them includes eliminating all the neighborhoods southeast of Jerusalem, like in Tuba, Sur Bahir, Arab Sawahir in the west, in addition to Beit Hanina and Anata and Shu'fat camps in the north, and making them part of the Israeli entity. It will also include the Ber Nabala compound and Jeep village, which are controlled by the Israeli military and administered by the Palestinian Authority in accordance to the Oslo Agreement. All the areas that are left in occupied Jerusalem will will remain under Israel's control.
القدس واضح جدا انها محتله It is very clear that Jerusalem is occupied. We will not compromise on any part of it. Not one neighborhood, not one street. With regards to the old city and the Blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque, we will not compromise on any part of it. This is our legal right. This is our Palestinian right, our Arab and Islamic right in this holy city. According to the second option, to make Jerusalem a Jewish majority, Israel will include within the city the two settlements, Ma'ali Adumim and Mishu Adumim, as well as the Har Gilo settlement and the Gush Etzion area, Bitar and Elite and the Gibrat Zaev areas. Israel will ask the United States and the international community to recognize these borders, which it will unilaterally put in place. This is what Ehud Olmert proposed in the Kadima Party campaign platform. All the many proposals, projects, thoughts, the reckless and oppressive measures against the Jerusalemites on their land, on their holy sites, as of now, these are all Israeli campaign positions. The current reality is that Jerusalem is divided, occupied and partitioned. It is being governed by the separation wall like a sharp knife that cuts through the flesh of the Palestinians. The third option is not to divide Jerusalem nor eliminate the Arab neighborhoods, but to incorporate all the settlements under the name Expanded Jerusalem that will be under the control of Israel. The Palestinians will be given other areas near Jerusalem that are currently under Israeli occupation control. All of the maps outlining each of the options have already been prepared for implementation on the ground. This will be done given the fact that some of the villages and neighborhoods belonging to Jerusalem will be annexed through the racist annexation and expansion wall which is being constructed by the Israeli occupation authorities in the West Bank. It appears that according to the Israelis, the upcoming years will be the years of separation and permanent settlement. Jerusalem will be divided by walls inside its villages and neighborhoods. The Israeli occupation will strengthen its control over the old city and the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Hamas-dominated Palestinian parliament has revoked recent legislation giving more powers to Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas. The increased powers included control of a constitutional court. They were agreed by the previous parliament with a majority from Mr Abbas's Fatah party. Fatah MPs walked out before the vote, saying the laws could not be changed. The uproar has dimmed hopes that the two factions might join forces in a national unity coalition. The first session of the new Palestinian parliament descended into shouting matches between rival parties. The new parliament has 74 Hamas MPs to 45 from Fatah. Before the session, former chief Palestinian negotiator Saeed Arakat spoke about his new role in political opposition. New day for the Palestinian people. It's, uh, it's uh, the second legislative council uh, with the Hamas majority. Um, uh, it's, it's a feeling, a new feeling for me to be in the opposition and I believe this is democracy at its best. I think we're uh, planting the seeds for democracy, we're planting the seeds for a government and an opposition and then an opposition and a government. Uh, the real issues are the same issues. Uh, the issues here are the challenges facing us uh, from the Israeli unilateral steps. Uh, we have heard the Israeli acting Prime Minister speaking about more unilateral steps in the West Bank, uh, which will culminate to the annexation of Jerusalem, the Jordan Valley, and more than 50% of the West Bank. This will just only add to the complexities. We urge the Israeli government to abandon the ways of unilateralism, dictation, and to opt for negotiations, and to resume the permanent status negotiations. Progressive Socialist Party MP Walid Jumblat met with UN Secretary General Kofi Annan yesterday. Sources say Annan urged the Druze leader to play a primary role in the national dialogue.
Anan and Jumblat also discussed the investigation into Rafiq al-Hariri's assassination, as well as the creation of an international tribunal to try suspects in his murder, in addition to redeploying the Lebanese army in the south. Jumblat gives a press conference today at the Association of Press Correspondents at the UN headquarters. He said he would be back in Beirut in the next 48 hours to resume dialogue on Monday. More in this report. Accompanied by Telecommunications Minister Marwan Ahmedi, the Progressive Socialist Party leader, met with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, Kofi Annan's representative for the application of UN Resolution 1559, Terry Rod Larson, and then Kofi Annan himself. According to a source at the UN headquarters, Annan and Jumla discussed the investigation to former Premier Rafiq Hariri's assassination, as well as the creation of an international tribunal to try suspects in his murder, in addition to redeploying the Lebanese army in the south. According to a statement published by the UN Secretariat, the UN Secretary General expressed his support for the national dialogue and urged Jumla to play a primary role in this dialogue when he returns to Beirut on Monday. In an interview with LBCI, Jumblat said his position regarding the Sherba farms was known and had not changed. He stressed he didn't believe the farms were under Lebanese sovereignty, even if they were Lebanese property. Jumblat further called on decisions at the dialogue table to be taken by majority vote and not by unanimity. He said he didn't want Iran land or Syria land in the Sherba farms. Finally, asked whether his statements in Washington had in a way provoked the suspension of the national dialogue, the Druze leader said the dialogue suspension allowed business life in downtown to go back to normal, but stressed dialogue would continue on Monday. Taiwan says it will, under no circumstances, retreat from its legal nuclear right, and that the government is making an all-out effort to uphold this right. President Ahmadinejad, who was speaking to a huge gathering of people in the less privileged city of al in Lorestan province, western Iran, said the progress made by Iran has triggered fury among the enemies of the Islamic establishment. He also pledged further employment opportunities in the province. Earlier in the day, President Ahmadinejad addressed a host of people in another provincial city of Burujert and said the government has done all it could to maintain the national nuclear right. He further noted Iran will reconsider its dealings with international entities if they keep refusing to give Iran its nuclear demands within the framework of the NPT. While the U.S. is exerting growing pressure on the international community to come against Iran over its peaceful program, the IAEA report has nothing in its content to show Tehran has diverted from peaceful track in its nuclear drive. Here is what Iranian envoy to the IAEA, Ali Asghar Sultaniya, told CNN on the matter. I have this report with me. And this paragraph clearly mentioned that after three years of uh, most robust investigation, agency has not found any evidence for diversion to nuclear weapons and prohibited purposes, and all nuclear materials have been accounted for. This is the report of the International Atomic Energy Agency, is the, which is the sole pertinent technical organization. In this report, Mr. Albrady says, and I quote for you, agency did not observe any unusual activities in the buildings visited in Colorado's parching military sites, and results of environmental samples did not indicate the presence of nuclear material at those locations. And this is what the Iranian nation believe over their legitimate right to nuclear technology for civilian purposes. It's all right, and even a small child says this. Nuclear technology is the result of the scientific growth of the country's young researchers. It's our legal right, and we stand for it. The Iranian nation achieved this technology during U.S. imposed sanctions, and it's a big effort. U.S. President George W. Bush supports the extension of U.S. sanctions against Iran for another five years. 
U.S. Undersecretary of State Nicholas Burns says the sanction bill requires major reforms since it will darken Washington's ties with its allies that, as the White House has put it, play a major role in changing Tehran's behavior. He accused Iran of creating a rift among five permanent members of the U.S. Security Council and said the extension of the embargo paves the way for fulfillment of what he described as Iran's aspiration. Under a bill ratified by the U.S. Congress in 1996, tight constraints have been placed on institutions which plan to invest in the Iranian oil and gas sector. The package has authorized U.S. government to act unilaterally against companies trading with Iran. Women's activities continued on March 8th for International Women's Day. Those participating called for more rights and for more protection of the achievements that have already been accomplished. Every year, March 8th is celebrated as International Women's Day, when the world collectively calls for affirming the participation of women in all walks of life. In this world, Palestinian women are a blessing from God for all men. They should not have just one day dedicated to them. Every day there should be something special for them. The woman is respected at all times. But I will say, as Palestinians, Arabs and Muslims in general, don't have an interest in celebrating with the people throughout the world on International Women's Day. Women are half of the society. This has been true all throughout time, anywhere and everywhere. And now they are reaffirming an active role for women. Women are half of the society, but regretfully they don't have a strong role in our society, especially in Middle Eastern society. I think that this day is special for Palestinian women because they are very important, not just the Palestinian woman, but all women throughout the whole world. However, the Palestinian woman is a special case that is impossible to ignore. Just talking about her case is not enough. She is a mother, a teacher, a politician, and an activist. Before the Palestinian woman gained her own rights, she achieved so much for her nation, for her people, for her sons who were prisoners and martyrs, and for the president. In this way, she's a mother, she's a sister, she's a daughter. This is the greatest right that she has gained over all the women in the world. <laughs> Today was a day of celebration for every woman who feels her uniqueness and who achieves her dreams with what she has. I'm married. I study in college. As of now, everything I've dreamed for has come true. In Palestine, special groups organized women's celebrations and marches, where slogans were chanted, demanding women's rights and honoring her presence. They also passed out flowers and gifts to women participating in the activities or women in their workplace. We as Palestinian women and as women in general who founded the feminist movement in Palestine about 30 years ago must devote March 8th to celebrate as a day of national struggle as well as a social struggle for equality. Today we'll have a party on the occasion of International Women's Day. Part of the activities will include distributing flowers to Palestinian women in Ramallah and Manara, Al Hisba, and some Palestinian companies as well. Equality and justice are basic rights that women struggle for. She continues to struggle to win her rights, hoping that society will appreciate her role. Despite Palestinian women's difficult situation and the continued struggle to gain equal rights by all Arab women, society continues to demand equal rights for her and have set aside this day to celebrate her presence as an integral part of society that cannot be ignored.
In its biggest single-day loss ever, the Weighted Consumer Price Index, CPI, at the Kuwaiti Stock Exchange, KSE, has lost 2.5% of its value. The price index started the day very poorly, and it continued dropping throughout the session, plummeting to its lowest level ever, just one hour before the trading bell sounded off. It has lost 440 points at the end of the trading session, the highest one-day loss in its history. The Kuwaiti Stock Exchange has dropped sharply, causing panic and chaos among traders. Outside the stock market, investors and traders have expressed sorrow and regret regarding poor performance of the KSE. I am a new investor in the Kuwaiti Stock Exchange. I wish I could recoup my capital. I would settle for even half of my money. The report from the Ministries of Finance and Trade and Administration of the KSE is clear. They claim that the market is strong. How is this possible? The market has lost 440 points. Only large companies have gained huge profits. Why did we have all these losses? We demand an explanation. There are new companies that go public every day. Some of them have limited capital, which drags the market down. They need to stop allowing such insignificant companies from trading at the KSE. Traders at the KSE reacted differently, giving different reasons for the market's poor performance. Some have pointed out that the economy is strong, and it is bound to help the market sooner or later. We're upset and disappointed by today's performance at the KSE. This is the first time in Kuwait's history that the market has plummeted significantly. We do not know the real reasons behind this drop. The economy is good, and we have confidence in Kuwait's internal policy. Again, we don't know the reasons behind such a plunge. I think it was an arrangement amongst large stockbrokers in order to manipulate trading activities and thus bring the KSE down. Along with other investors, those traders also used huge sums of capital in today's trading session in order to corner the stock market. Theoretically speaking, financial and stock exchange markets rely heavily on a number of factors. Some of those aspects are economic conditions, price indexes, returns on investments, and expected earnings and distribution of dividends to shareholders. Another factor is the amount of capital and liquid cash poured into the market. Large capitals and wealth enhance investors' buying power and stimulate stock trading activities. Practically speaking, Kuwait's local economy has developed at a steady rate in recent years. In addition, it continues to thrive due to profits and proceeds from high and stable oil prices. I do not think that the Kuwaiti Stock Exchange was necessarily sabotaged. It is the demand and supply that affect its performance. Let the market run on its own without outside intervention. There are huge sums of money and wealth in Kuwait. Oil prices are also very attractive. There are indications that all prices in the region will be $50 a barrel. السيولة النقدية حققت نموا ترجمته أرقام عرض النقد الصادرة عن البنك المركزي Huge sums of capital and hard cash in Kuwait were translated into real positive figures in the currency exchange market, announced by the central bank. Its index jumped from 1.3% during January, reaching 13 billion dinars. However, the KSE has performed poorly in recent days due to frustration among investors who have received low earnings and returns on their investments. Several large companies announced that they will increase their investing capitals by large percentages. The KSE has fluctuated significantly in recent days due to negative in indexes of the market and panic among traders. The KSE was in the red in several of its trading sessions during the last months, bringing with it painful losses to traders and investors, especially small ones. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.